Hey there, Internet. I've just recorded about an hour of me rambling on and on about my experiences building a CNC machine or two. If you're interested, stay tuned, and I'll try to share with you as much as I can about my experiences failing and struggling and learning about how to DIY build a CNC. Let's start with a little background about myself. A long time ago, probably over 25 years ago, I did do some work with some heavy equipment. Uh, I did some architectural mill work and I had worked with some big machines, you know, five horsepower direct drive table saws. They're pretty powerful, uh, but they're really nothing compared to like a 35 horsepower CNC spindle. That's really something, but, you know, I had that experience. I was working towards maybe, you know, 10 thou accuracy, but not like five tenths accuracy. And there's quite a bit that I didn't know, uh, from the metrology perspective, uh, that I had to learn over that time. I've built five different CNC machines. My first machine was a SLA printer, which is pretty simple. It's just a Z linear movement and you, you have to control the light source. Um, so it's, it's, you know, from a CNC perspective, it's pretty simplified con uh, construction and um, the forces are you know pretty easy to understand i think it was a good place to start but you know it was it wasn't exactly what i needed to know when i actually built something that was going to cut material versus print material you know i have a technology background i generally prefer prefer open source uh, tools there's quite a lot of tools out there uh, that you can use but uh, you know, I, my selection has really been based on trying to avoid proprietary systems and using open source technology wherever possible. So the format is unknowable as a beginner that I can try to relay to you. Um, that might save you a little bit of time. I wanna talk about what I think I got right and what I think I got wrong. And then I'll wrap up by talking about what I think based on my current level of experience is still hard and what I think is easy uh, when you're going about thinking about designing a CNC machine. So what are the, what are the unknowable things as somebody new to building CNC or maybe somebody who's new to CNC in general? I didn't know much about CNC. I'd never operated a CNC machine. I didn't have any experience running a professionally built CNC machine. So I was really starting from a very what I would say is a, 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 a total new perspective on what CNC is all about. And I, I think one of the big mistakes or one of the big uh, misconceptions that I had is I, th I really thought that CNC was going to be something where you design a part, you throw the stock into the machine and that's it. You're done. You, you're going to pop out a, a perfect part on the other side and that's it. Well, that's, that's not really how CNC works there's a lot more to it and you know the basic thing that you should get your expectations set correctly around is really what is cnc good for and i think that falls into a, a couple different categories the first category is cnc is really good for things where you have to make a bunch of parts and you spend and invest a bunch of time in uh, a setup you uh, invest a bunch of time in developing your feeds and speeds and fi figuring out which cutters you want to use. You figure out how to hold the work and you figure out the properties of the material. And you have to, you know, you have to go through and try to be efficient in all of those steps. And if you're only doing one thing, it's fairly impractical generally. Now there are some exceptions to that. So if you, if you look at it from the perspective of what can you do with a manual machine and how much time would that take versus what can you do with a CNC machine? There, the, the exceptions really are things like you want to, like for instance, on a manual mill, if you don't have a rotary table, doing curves is not easy. The manual mill really moves in straight lines. If you want to bore large holes, uh, you can do it on a manual mill, but if your mill is slightly underpowered, it can take quite a lot of time to make large, accurate holes in different things, different materials like steel. But what is CNC good for? It's good for things that you can't do on a manual machine 
where you know it's worth it to make the investment to figure out the toll paths and the the cutting geometry and doing the cam and CAD work. So I would say that's one area what CNC is good for. The other area is mass production of parts where you're going to make the investment in producing 50 or 100 of something. So some general things about CNC that you may not know. You're going to have to learn CAD, computer aided, aided design. And there's a lot of CAD packages out there. Um, from an open source perspective, there's some pretty good ones. Once you finish your design, once you create a three-dimensional representation of the part you want to make in the computer, then you have to get into CAM, which is computer-aided manufacturing. And unfortunately, on the open source side of the spectrum, there just aren't a bunch of really good quality CAM packages that are integrated with the, with the CAD packages. What I found personally is Fusion 360 um, is, a, is a tool that is well worth learning. The integration is fantastic between CAD and CAM. The CAM, the CAM workflow is pretty intuitive it works well. Now, unfortunately, it was just recently nerfed by Autodesk. So some of the features that were available to everybody aren't just no longer available anymore. And that's unfortunate, but you're going to have to learn CAD. You're going to have to learn CAM. You're going to have to make compromises with respect to how quickly you can machine something. So if you're watching YouTube videos and you're seeing these big giant machines hogging off, huge cuts with giant cutters, you're not likely going to be building a machine that can do anything close to that. So your cutting speeds uh, versus your budget are going to be a big engineering constraint. You're going to have to make trade-offs there. The, the next thing that I think is really important to understand is you have to hold the work, meaning the CNC machine, if the work isn't held securely, you're going to have to go really slow. Figuring out how to hold the work by itself is a whole challenge. It's something that you're not prepared for, but you're going to be learning about. So, you know, work holding is hard and you're going to have to learn quite a lot about different strategies for holding the work. What the raw stock uh, is going to need to be like, what is a good vice? I mean, that's a really basic thing that I didn't know anything about when I started this, but um, understanding the importance of a good vice is, is a big part of the learning curve. The next thing is, for a lot of parts, manual machining is likely going to be faster. When I started this journey, I didn't have any metalworking experience really at all. I ended up acquiring a milling machine, a manual milling machine, and a lathe, and I had to go out and buy a larger drill press. It made a lot of sense to buy a metal cutting bandsaw. You don't want to be using it. I mean, your time is valuable. You don't want to be hacksawing a one inch piece of steel for three hours. It's, it's really not any fun and you're, it's not rewarding in any way. So, um, there are going to be potentially some, some investments that you're going to have to make in, uh, other equipment. That's not CNC equipment. It's expensive. Um, you're gonna, you, you may be like through experimentation, you may be able to ramp your costs, meaning you can build a machine. Your first machine can be pretty cheap for, for to have a learning platform and to do things like cut MDF or softer materials. It, it doesn't require a huge investment. You can get up and running with a, with, a, with a machine that can do those sorts of things. And it's probably the best thing or the best approach is to start with something inexpensive, cutting materials that are not super hard. And, and that'll give you some foundation where you can start to apply all the advice that you're gonna read on the internet. And there is a lot of advice on the internet. Now you're going to read the advice and you're not going to really understand it. But I think, I think my advice to the beginner would be experience. That's what, you, that's what you're going to need to start building. And you, you can spend all, all day long reading forums and reading different people's opinions about different things. And there's really no substitute for the experience. Your costs somewhat are also going to be related to time. And as you build a custom CNC machine, you're trading your time for those upfront costs. And if you're, if you're not willing to fail, you're not willing to spend time failing and learning, 
you really shouldn't be trying to build your own CNC machine. Just go out and make the investment. You're not going to really save money uh, in the long run by doing it yourself. What you're investing it in by doing it yourself is really is really the learning experience. It's almost like you're you're giving yourself an education through through this uh, through this long process of of learning how all this engineering works. <clears throat> now, not all that cost is going to be. Uh, lost costs. So you're going to make investments and those investments, if you're wise, will be things that you can reuse and they're going to, they're going to give you more capabilities in the long run. So what, what are the things you're going to read about? You're going to read everywhere that rigidity is king and it's really true, but it's hard to really understand what that means. Rigidity is going to be a trade-off of cost versus uh, rigidity. You can go out and buy the best components and if you have an unlimited budget you can build a ridiculously rigid machine. You're gonna have a high cost, you're also gonna have a lot of weight and um, that's not, that's not, it's either cost or weight. There's, you're not gonna avoid um, dealing with those parts of the trade-offs but um, you have to think about all the parts. For instance, you can, you can use super super heavy-duty linear rails and if you're using, let's say, a lead screw, um, you're not going to have a rigid machine. There's just too much back, backlash in a, in a lead screw. If you buy a cheap spindle, you're going to have issues. Uh, you're not going to be able to cut as fast as you want to cut. Or, or, you know, again, it's, it's how much money do you want to spend for how quick, how quick can you machine things? The, the quality of the cutters that you buy, that's going to have an impact. The materials that you construct the frame out of will have an impact. All these things are going to add up and produce an overall machine rigidity, which is going to constrain how quickly you can machine parts. It's not fun to stand in front of a machine and babysit it. Meaning, if 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 it takes three hours to make a small part, you're not going to want to you're not going to want to use the machine. It's you know you're going to have to maybe temper your expectations on your first machine and based on what you think it can do. And again, you're going to have to keep in the back of your head that you're making this investment in, in the learning experience. When I built my, my first CNC cutting machine, I actually used open builds, uh, V V rail system. And they're just, it's, it's a cost compromise. They're cheap. Uh, they're easy to put together, but they're not, strong and rigid and while they might work for very slow cutting uh, they're not going to work for high speed cutting the next thing that you might consider is a supported rail uh, I've also experimented with these and they have their own issues um, one of the main issues is the tolerances that they're built to are low the bearings are in a C shape and that C shape doesn't have a, a symmetric capability for resisting different forces, meaning it's going to be stronger when the force is going in one direction than another. It's, it's, it's C-shaped, and they tend to open up in, under certain loads. So you can get away with using them in some parts of your machine. And again, if you're cutting soft materials, it may not make a huge difference. But if you're going to try to cut aluminum or steel, uh, it may not be the right solution for you unless you, unless you really think about how you're gonna, um, how how you're building them into your design and the size of them and all those other things. You can go out and buy ball screws, um, but if I've seen a bunch of builds on the internet where the there's some flimsy angle bracket made of you know, you know one eighth inch steel. That's it's not properly mounted and the thing about a ball screw is you can have a 16 millimeter fairly heavy duty ball screw but if the if the loads that get transferred into the bearings that are holding the ball screw if the bearings can't handle those loads then you're gonna you're gonna have movement all over the place and it, that's gonna go right back into how quickly you can do the machining that you want to do there's other things that I had to learn so Finding materials is tough. One of the things that I found that I thought was good, but I learned wasn't, was uh, I found a five-inch I-beam. It turns out that I-beams are really bad at 
dealing with twisting moments of force. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't really do myself any favors by using what I thought was a really stout giant piece of steel. Um, it just wasn't really good at resisting a twisting force. And so understanding where those forces exist and how they act on the frame of the machine is, is important. You're probably, you can, you might learn that from a forum. Uh, you might not, you know, I had to learn the hard way that an I beam just wasn't any good. You're not going to find the parts or the materials that you need at Home Depot. Uh, you're going to have to develop some skills around acquiring those parts or spending lots of money because you can order them online but they're all heavy the shipping costs tend to be high you can spend a lot a lot of money ordering you know different materials um, that you have no experience with so it's a big challenge one piece of advice i'd give is develop a habit of checking the different the different marketplaces you have for for local goods i, I tend to try to check craigslist uh, for different materials on a regular basis. You can look in face, Facebook Marketplace or OfferUp. There's a bunch of different places where you might find stuff. Uh, worst case is eBay where you're, you're going to have to pay for shipping. But if you can avoid paying for shipping, you're going to save quite a bit. And if you can find somebody's excess stock, you may be able to save quite a lot of money. So develop that habit of checking, checking a Craigslist and, and whatever else that you think you might find stuff search for you know steel plate aluminum plate you know plate seems to be a very expensive and hard to find in a retail setting but uh, every now and again you see somebody who just wants to get rid of something that's heavy and you'll find yourself a good deal learning about cutters is a whole thing in and of itself carbide is brittle if your machine doesn't have a lot of rigidity you're going to be breaking a lot of carbide if you're going too fast. High speed steel is much more durable. However, it dulls more quickly and it cuts slower. So you're, you're right back to, do you really want to be standing and babysitting a CNC machine for three hours to make a part? I don't know that much about cutters, unfortunately. I mean, I've bought a bunch of cutters. I've used a bunch of cutters. I haven't invested in high end cutters. I, I, I don't think my machine necessarily would benefit from, from that, but I just don't know. So it's one of the areas that even after four years, I, I don't have hardly any good experience in, but, uh, as a beginner, what I'd recommend is you, you just start out buy a cheap set of high speed steel cutters and, um, think about the, the tool holder that you want to put them in. And it's a good way to, to get started. For, for low risk, little upfront cost. And if you break them or you, you chip a tooth, no big deal. Spindles, um, this is a, you know, it's a hard investment to make when, when you're just getting into the hobby. But a cheap spindle is maybe the worst thing that you can invest in. There's quite a lot of low end spindles available on eBay and Amazon. It's really hard to think about the spindle by itself costing a couple thousand bucks when your budget for the whole machine is 500 bucks. But the, the quality of the spindle is, I would say, paramount. And it doesn't matter how good the rest of your machine is. If your spindle is, is not rigid, you're going to be struggling. So avoid the $100 spindle eBay special. Uh, unless you're going to be cutting something really soft like pine, uh, even, even with MDF, the, the lower end spindles are, are a struggle. Changing the tools in the spindle is also, uh, maybe it's just me, but it, it really is. It's something I don't like doing. It's something I am hesitant to do. Uh, you got to dig the wrenches out. It's, you, you, you know, with a collet chuck, you got to have you got to have your hands on two wrenches and the, 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 the cutter. And if it falls out, you might chip your cutter. Um, it just, just the holding of the tool in the spindle is, is a challenge. Ideally what you want to have is an automatic tool changer to buy a new spindle with an ATC. You're looking at, you know, 1800 bucks minimum for something new. If you want to go exotic, 
you can maybe save a little bit of money. I'm using a NSK spindle with a automatic tool changer function, but I had to machine, I had to machine some parts to make it work. If you don't have a lathe then you don't have, you, you might not be able to do something like that. To start out, you want to buy a decent quality. You're probably going to have to spend 200 bucks on a decent spindle with, with decent bearings. The most important part of the, the spindle that you want to look at is the bearings. Angular contact bearings are the most ideal for a CNC spindle. You, unfortunately, uh, there's horror stories where people have bought spindles where they believe there was angular contact bearings in the spindles and they they were literally fakes. Uh, once they took the, once they inspected the bearings, they actually had to pull the bearings off the spindle and take the, um, take the dust shields off of the bearings. And then they realized that they were just fake, uh, angular contact bearings. So they're, those lower end spindles are disposable essentially it's a motor and the bearings you're not going to likely re install bearings on something like that so you should just keep that in mind it's got a limited lifetime and it's something you're going to depending on how much you're using the machine you're likely going to have to buy another one and you're tr you're trading off spending lots and lots of money up front for having something that's essentially disposable you might consider making your own spindle it's something that you can do and you can maybe get away with something that's marginally decent. But uh, if you're going to make something that's competitive with, with uh, something that you can purchase, you, as a beginner, it's not like that you're going to come up with anything fantastic. If you're milling maybe PCBs, again, cutting like pine or something like that, you might be able to make your own spindle. Um, but if you, if you're going to be cutting steel, or if you want to cut aluminum quickly, you're not likely going to be making a spindle that's competitive with something you can buy for the, for the cost basis. Now the style of machine that you want to make, it, it doesn't necessarily pay to try to make a machine that can do a whole bunch of different stuff. If you get a mill conversion, it's going to be much better at machining high, higher accuracy steel and aluminum parts. The work envelope is a big constraint uh, that is going to really dictate the overall machine rigidity, the overall cost of the machine, the weight of the machine, and what the machine is well suited to do. So you really got to be careful on trying to constrain what you want the machine to do. So for instance, you could try to build a gantry mill that can cut steel but it's probably not worth it. You're, you're maybe better off building a gantry mill that can cut, you know, plywood panels or plywood sheet goods and building a separate machine. If you want to have something that can do high accuracy, uh, aluminum or steel parts. So once you, once you've got some ideas about the spindle and the materials that you're going to make the frame out of and the frame construction, and the linear motion and the how you're going to tr translate your your motor motion and into your linear motion uh, you got to start thinking about the electronics and the power and our, our brothers in europe and asia have some advantages because the standard power over there is 220. unfortunately in the cnc world you're going to have to make some decent compromises when it comes to powering things with 110, particularly the spindle. Most of the stepper motors or servo motors that you might want to use are likely going to be DC powered. And stepping the 110 down into DC lower voltages is, is not, not really a big deal, but um, it's hard to find a really good quality 110 volt spindle or a VFD that, that is reliable and uses uh, 110. The options are fairly limited. Once you get in past the the main power, once you get past the main power, the, the next thing to think about is the electronics that you're going to want to use to drive your CNC machine. And there's a lot of different options out there. You see a large community of folks uh, that use Mach 3, Mach 4, 
And those Mach 3, Mach 4 machines generally are going to require a PC that has a parallel port. And that in and of itself is, it's a constraint that I, personally I haven't wanted to mess with. Then you've got a whole another class of controllers that are proprietary. There's UC, CNC, which I don't have any experience with. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff where you, you know, you buy a quote unquote packaged up controller and, um, you, you have to stay within that ecosystem, which is, which is generally closed sourced. My preference would be, as I said earlier, is to use an open source platform. The two, well, there's, I don't even know if machine kit is, is popular anymore, but, uh, there's Linux CNC which requires a, a Mesa card or some kind of FPGA card that sits between the, the Linux PC and your, your steppers or whatever your, your steppers or your servos or your spindle. Those, those cost anywhere from a hundred bucks and you can get up, up and up and up and up and more expensive peripherals. I haven't, I haven't, I don't have any experience with Linux CNC, so I can't really speak to it other than I, I do know that the, the, those upfront costs are higher and there are cheaper alternatives. And the, the one that I went with when I started out was uh, Gerbil. There's a long story about, about Gerbil. Gerbil was developed for an Arduino uh, that had a very small amount of memory. And what they were able to do with the original version of Gerbil was pretty incredible. Packing the functionality that they packed into uh, the software, it's very highly optimized for, for uh, a particular Atmel chip. The, the, the recent problem with Gerbil is that the maintainer hasn't been able to do much at more. I mean, they're really constrained by the architecture that was targeted. And say core Gerbil is something that's mostly dying. The good news is there's other versions of Gerbil that have popped up. So the two main ones that I would that would that I would talk about are the ESP32 version of Gerbil by Bart Dring and Gerbil Howl. Gerbil Howl is it basically has a hardware abstraction layer and supports a bunch of different 32-bit microprocessors. Bart's fork of Gerbil is specifically targeted at the ESP32 and it's got a lot of effort going into it from from a development perspective. There's a pretty long roadmap of features that are planned and Bart's making investments to try to make to try to make the whole gerbil ecosystem highly modular and that makes it really easy for somebody who's just getting started with machining to to have a lot of different options. But what you know, you're going to have to choose some kind of controller architecture. The two main buckets of architecture are going to be proprietary. You might have to pay for a license or you, the license might be bundled in with the hardware, but the, the source is closed and end users will not be able to make improvements and modifications. So you're, you, what you get is what you get essentially, but it's, it, they're generally more integrated. And then the alternative is going to be to go with something open source like Linux CNC uh, or, or gerbil or the gerbil derivatives. And the, you're going to have more people contributing and adding features, but the ecosystem is going to be all over the place because everybody who's adding to the platform has a different set of priorities and nobody's making money on it. So my preference would be to go with the open source platform when things are funky or there's more than one way to do something they generally have more options whereas a proprietary system unfortunately their way might be the only way or the the quote unquote correct way and if you don't like that way you're kind of stuck with an open source that's that's why i prefer gerbil once you once you pick the platform, then you're going to have to think about what what does the platform support. So, are you going to use stepper motors? Are you going to use servo motors? How are you going to control your spindle? Those are different things that you're going to have to think about. 
you're going to have to look into building an enclosure, uh, finding a power supply that works well, routing all your wires, mounting the different sensors that you're going to need. All that stuff is, is difficult, and particularly the wiring. You're going to have to figure out how to choose the right connectors for you. I mean, there's 500 million different kinds of connectors. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to pick connectors that you later realize just aren't any good. You're going to spend time learning how to crimp, uh, failing at crimps, uh, <laughs> uh, having shorted wires, electrical noise. There, there's just a whole uh, rabbit hole of issues just around the electronics. But my advice to a beginner would be buy a good crimping tool. Try to find connectors that are easy to connect and disconnect. Avoid hard wiring things like don't solder directly to your controller board or, or anything else. You, you're going to, you're going to be putting stuff together and taking it apart as you work out your design kinks. And so being able to connect and disconnect things easily is, is something you're, you're going to want to put a priority on. So now you've got, you know, you've thought about your spindle, you've thought about your linear motion, you've thought about your frame and the materials that you're going to use, you've thought about the types of work that you want to do and the materials you want to hold in your machine. The next thing you're going to have to be learning about is how to measure perpendicularity, how to measure uh, squareness and parallelness. You're going to want to figure out how much rigidity your system has. You're going to want to learn how to measure backlash. And if you don't have any tools to do the measurement, you're just going to be guessing. And I'll tell you right now, just looking at it, you're not likely going to be able to tell much from just trying to look at a machine as it's trying to do the work that you want it to do. Video can be helpful. A lot of times you can see things on video that you can't see while you're in the act of trying to machine something. There's there's a lot to think about as you're trying to make sure the cutter doesn't break and the machine doesn't break or crash or anything like that. The video can be helpful, but you really need a good set of tools that will help you measure uh, and understand what the machine is doing and what the machine's, how it's flexing, where it's flexing, is it square? and all those sorts of things. Once you've, once you've got something slapped together and you're able to measure it, now you're back, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a loop. You're gonna enter the other part of the loop, which is you're gonna analyze the system that you've built. You're gonna figure out where it's strong and where it's weak. And then you're gonna have to make decisions around what do you wanna improve? And you're gonna have to prioritize those decisions to look at how things are geared the pitch of your ball screws uh, or your rack and pinion, where can you use belts, where can't you use belts, what are the right belts to use, all of those things are going to be really, you know, you're going to build a first machine and then you're going to, you're going to have to do that analysis and, and try to prioritize where to make the investments to improve the machine. At some point, the machine you build, it's probably not going to be worth making more investments in. And so you should be ready for your first machine or two to just pull the plug, start over and take the lessons that you've learned and apply them to the, a, a better design and figuring out what that point is, is difficult, but you should be prepared for that. And you're not going to, it's very unlikely that you'll design a machine day one that does everything that you want it to do. So now I'll talk a little bit about what, what I think I got right. So the things I got right, the main, the first thing I think I got right is just, just do it. Don't be afraid to put something together and have it fail and don't invest too much early into trying to make it perfect because it's not likely going to be perfect and you're going to have to start over at some point probably. So be wary of the pursuit of perfection. You don't have the context or the experience to understand the different contributions of all the decisions you're going to make. And you can, you can spend forever on decisions, the different trade-offs that you're going to have to make. 
at some point you have to have a little voice in the back of your head that says just do it just get something up and running see how it works and then iterate based on what you've learned from from that little experiment the best way to just capture all this into a, a little rule that you can have in your head is to say if it's easy to undo don't be afraid to do it but if it's hard to undo then that's that's the point at which you should really do a careful analysis so net net i think i was successful building things even though they didn't always work and and not spending forever on the on trying to design the perfect thing when when you are do, doing the design uh you could tr you could try to use a piece of paper and a pen and draft it up you could try to use sketchup i've seen i've seen people design entire cnc machines in sketchup on the list of things i think i got right i think investing in learning fusion 360 the cad the cam the finite element analysis investing and learning all those things i think really actually paid off in dividends when i started it was very difficult and i didn't have any experience in using any of these types of tools but at this point if i want to design a part i can hop into fusion 360 and i can i can design a part in five minutes and generate the g-code take it out to the garage and have the machine working on the part very very quickly so i think it's it was a good investment it doesn't have to be fusion 360 uh you can use other packages but i would definitely say that you you want to be able to design the parts of the machine join them together so from a fusion 360 perspective you you really want to know how to use the joints in fusion 360 so join everything together uh see look at the motion of the joints and this will help you figure out you know if you if you have if you're going to run into things or uh if if a bolt is going to interfere you can you can drive the joints and see how the machine's moving as all the parts are put together once you once you have the machine designed you can use uh, a finite element analysis and actually look at how the machine is going to deal with different loads so you can simulate cutter load and see you know literally uh, see a visualization of where the stresses are highest how much the machine is going to move uh, all those things you can you can do in a computer simulation before you you put the thing together it's not perfect and i wouldn't spend all my time in the finite element analysis but it will give you some idea based on the materials that you chose and the dimensions of the materials modeling it out and then simulating it just it's going to give you some idea of what to expect and it may save you some time in the long term there's a benefit to easily being able to run that analysis after you've designed the machine in, in, a, in a CAD package. The other benefit is one, once you've built the machine and you need to design parts, you're going to have that foundation so that you can design your parts and do the CAM work uh, that you're going to need to do without the learning curve. And it's going to require an investment of time. It'll be frustrating at times. You're going to make mistakes. But the net net, I would say, is learn how to use the joints, learn how to make a parameterized design, learn a little bit about the finite element analysis, and invest some time learning in the in the how to use the CAM functionality. I'd also say that just building experience was something I got right. It's weird to say it, but um, having the experience gives you the context for when you go out and seek more advice to really understand what people are trying to tell you. I'm glad I invested in a good spindle eventually. The quality difference is astounding and uh, it definitely makes life easier. I avoided spending too much time making perfect parts. Like, uh, for example, you could build, you could, you could spend a couple days designing and installing and putting together a perfect end stop fixture that's integrated into your machine but if you're gonna if you're gonna redesign the machine in two months it's, it may not be worth it the reality is is sometimes hot melt glue super glue tape 
these things can be good enough to start to test your design and you shouldn't be afraid to to go really low end because you're not going to again you're not going to know how the machine's going to perform at all until you get something up and running and, and actually watch the machine do some cutting I'm glad I invested in buying a lathe and a manual mill. I can use them for all sorts of things that are unrelated to building a CNC machine. And as, you know, as I as I talked about in the very beginning, the CNC isn't really good for everything. If you if you've got a quick part that you want to make, a lot of times just taking it over to the manual mill or the lathe is is going to be orders of magnitude more efficient than doing the CAD work, the CAM work figuring out your feeds and speeds, ruining a couple parts because you made a mistake. Uh, just take it over to the manual machine. And if you have it, it, it just rounds out your overall experience. Some of the tooling investments I made, I think were good. Uh, investing in a good vice early was well worth it. Well, actually, investing in a bad vice early was worth it because I, I learned what a good vice versus a bad vice actually was. Uh, buying a surface plate, I think, was a, was a great investment. And I think I did a pretty decent job of balancing, you know, buying, avoiding buying the, the absolute tippy top best of the best as far as tools, uh, but not buying the bottom of the barrel. As far as the machine design, the latest thing that I think I did a good job with was, was having multiple spindles. So my, uh, my latest experiment has a, uh, a spindle that's really geared towards say sub 3000 RPM cutting speeds, things well suited for steel or harder materials. And then a higher speed spindle that can go 30,000 plus RPM. And that's great for things like PCBs or materials that can be cut with a high speed and a high feed rate, but you do, or where you might want to take more of a HSM kind of cutting approach. The areas I got wrong, um, are I, the first one was the the work envelope that I was targeting. So I made a machine that, you know, I made a machine that had a 1,000 by 600 millimeter set of linear rails, and I was hopeful that I could use that one machine to do, you know, high accuracy aluminum parts as well as cutting plywood and MDF and things like that. Unfortunately, I didn't have the foundation to build that machine the way it needed to be built. I underestimated the construction requirements of the frame for that machine. And it just, it just, it was kind of a compromise all the way around. I wasn't really good at anything. So my work envelope targets were, were, they were unrealistic. Essentially the mistake is trying to have a machine that's doing a, a very wide range of work is not a good idea. Designing a machine that doesn't have the right amount of Z travel is also a mistake that I've made. Now this is, this is at odds with my previous mistake, which is having a work envelope that's too large. There's a, there's a balance here. But if you're going to want to hold your work in a vise, you, you need to have enough Z travel to change the tool, to put the tools in, to get the work in there. And then if let's say you only have eight inches of Z travel, your vice is going to be three inches. And if your work is two inches, well, you're really constrained in what kind of tool you can put into the spindle at that point. I would say one of the main things to consider is how do you want to hold the work and what tools, what, is, what are the lengths of tools that you want to fit into your spindle and make sure that that is sized appropriately. For, for instance, if you want to use a half inch drill chuck, right there you're going to lose a couple inches of Z. And then you got to be able to get that drill chuck into the spindle, which means you may not want to jog away from the work every time just to get the tool in and out. So thinking about your Z travel, thinking about the work holding and thinking about the tools that you want to put into the cutter, whether you want to use a chuck or some other kind of tool that's lengthy uh, is going to, is going to impact uh, how you think about how much Z travel that you're going to want for your machine. If you're just cutting panels and you, you, you're never going to cut more than a three quarter inch piece of uh, sheet goods, then you don't need that much Z travel. But as soon as you get a vise in there and as soon as you want to use a longer cutter, you won't be able to. 
if if you've if you've tightened down your work envelope in the Z too much. My expectations on how quickly I could produce, produce quality parts was was way off, and uh, I talked about this earlier. But just try to curb your expectations on what your part quality is going to be on your first couple machines. I'd say simple things like planning ahead for the right size fasteners, the right quantity of fasteners, uh, modeling the fasteners in so that you you can see if they're going to interfere with parts of the machine. I think that was a a mistake that I made several times that I, uh, that I've hopefully overcome and learned my lessons from. My expectations on the cost of the materials was considerably off. Uh, Do some research on the material cost, but if you're going to have four inch steel tubing, it's just not cheap to buy from uh, in small quantities from a retailer. This is where finding that stuff on Craigslist really pays off. But unfortunately, if you find it on Craigslist, it's not necessarily going to be exactly what you want. So sometimes you find the material and then you design around the material that you're going to find. Currently, with the machines that I've built, I don't believe uh, I've had enough rigidity to really push any of my spindles as hard as they they can go. And I believe, uh, although I'm not really sure, is that my all my spindles are underpowered at this point. So. I think, you know, as soon as you start to improve the overall rigidity of the machine and you've got the linear motion dialed in and there's very little backlash and the frame is strong enough, then you start to look at is, does my spindle have enough horsepower to remove the material at the rates that you want to remove it. I'm not at that point yet where I can really push the spindle, uh, to the, you know, to the max, but my goal is to get there and, uh, that'll be more learning on that I'll get to do uh, when I get to that happy place. The final thing I really regret is I made an investment in hybrid stepper motors from JMC and it was the, I, I can't even tell you how many hours I spent troubleshooting electrical noise. The way that these, some of these stepper motors work is uh, they have a, it's called an IGBT and they, they regulate the steppers through what's called current chopping and if it, it, I don't I don't I'm not really sure exactly what the problem was but these stepper drivers that I got uh, were just insanely noisy from an electrical perspective and uh, there just wasn't anything I could do about it so I made a big mistake there I, I should have actually removed them from the equation and used a different stepper driver uh, early on, but, uh, I didn't do that. And I, 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 I just wanted to fix it and I wanted to fix it. And I tried everything in the, in the universe that I could think of to fix it. And it just, it just wasn't in the cards. These drivers, I believe would be okay. If you had a 24 volt control signal, gerbil, uh, Linux CNC, a bunch of these platforms have either five volt control signals or 3.3 volt control signals. And the susceptibility of those lower voltage control systems to noise is much, much higher. So, you know, it might be one of the benefits of going with a proprietary platform that has a higher voltage control signal for durable, for other things that use five volts. These particular drivers were just a endless rat hole of losing time and being highly frustrated. So now that I've shared all that, and it's a lot, there's a few things that I think are still hard. I still struggle balancing between a good design and getting it done. I think the more experience I get, the more difficult that becomes. Balancing the cost and the quality of the materials and components is also uh, definitely still a challenge. Finding materials cheap is difficult. Something as simple as making an accurate but large hole uh, and hard materials is is with an underpowered machine is difficult and something you have to constrain yourself with. I'm constrained on space, and so having a giant enclosure around the CNC machine itself is not really very practical. But the chips just get everywhere, and so you know, ha- making sure they don't get into your electronics is is pretty important. Uh, versus making a big mess is also not great. 
I wish I had a better solution for dealing with uh, the enclose, enclosing the machine. And finally, I like to make stuff and making quality components and making quality tools is hard. It takes a ton of time and it, it almost always takes four times longer than you expect it's going to take. And pulling the trigger and just purchasing something is something I should do more often. What's easy? Use clamps. Temporarily mounting things, you'd be surprised at what you can get away with with the, with the right kind of clamps. So make some investments in good clamps and clamp stuff versus spending a whole bunch of time making parts to mount things in a permanent way. You, you, you don't know if it's going to work or not. So don't be afraid to just clamp something in there, see how it works. And then once you've decided it works, then you can go ahead and make that investment in, in, a, in a longer term part. Plan ahead is easy. Uh, order stuff, wait for the boat from China to arrive, and save yourself some money on things that you know you're going to need. Now this is changing a little bit with the, the changes in e-parcel pricing from China, but there's still deals to be found. And if you can think ahead, it's just do it. Make those investments in some of the consumable stuff that you're going to want to have and uh, save yourself a little bit of money. From a work holding perspective, I would say one of the easiest things that I've learned is using super glue and tape. It's super effective work holding strategy. It's easy to do. Get the right super glue, buy a big couple rolls of tape and learn how to do it because it's, it's, there's some things that you just can't hold any other way. Having an ATC is a dream. You know, changing tools sucks. And I'm so glad that I have a tool changer that is easy to use. So I'm, uh, that's a huge investment that I, I'm glad I made. And I'm glad I bought a bunch of quality tools and components that I can use for other things other than CNC builds. So what is the essential toolkit that you need? Uh, I think a CAD and CAM package is uh, essential. I think uh, having a dial test indicator and a dial indicator are both required tools and having a decent set of calipers and a machinist square, having one, two, three blocks, and you might as well buy four or five or six and have a bunch of them that are useful in a multitude of different ways. Having the right kind of clamps is great. I've used everything from Jurgensen style wood clamps to the same style metal clamps, C clamps, the plastic uh, junky Home Depot clamps. Having lots of clamps is, is a good investment in general if you're going to do your own stuff. Having it for a CNC build is, is hugely valuable. You're going to need a good straight edge. I would avoid going at the bottom of the barrel here. Uh, this is something you're going to have to pay for. If you want a high level of accuracy, don't spend 300 bucks, but um, don't buy the cheapest thing that you can find. But a good straight edge is, is essential. Having a magnet, a magnetic indicator holder, a Noga style indicator holder is also what I would say is essential. You're going to need a center punch and a drill. You're going to want to invest in some quality spiral taps or at least some taps in general and uh, having a, a, a drill that you don't mind using is, uh, is, is definitely beneficial. So that's the absolute bare minimum of tooling that I think that you need. What I would say is better tooling is, um, is a much more expensive proposition. But having reamers is, I had never used reamers uh, they are great. They're just great tools. Uh, if you're 3D printing parts, I think reamers are essential for getting your parts to the right dimensions. Drills just don't make round holes and uh, drill bits don't. So get a good set of reamers. It doesn't even have to be a good set of reamers. Just get a, the, even the cheapest set of reamers on Amazon is better than a twist drill in a lot of cases. Having a surface plate is a huge benefit. It's hard to understand if something's flat or square or parallel if you don't have a surface plate, if you don't have that reference surface. Have an indicator stand for the surface plate. You can you can get away with using a something like a one, two, three block in, a, in the magnetic base if you want to. It's probably not a terrible solution, but it might be worth it to have an indicator stand. 
I'd say having two, four, six blocks uh, is also a very worthwhile investment. They're about 80 bucks, but you'll find lots and lots and lots of uses for them. And they're great for different setups that you might use as you're actually machining parts later down the road. I'd say having a good set of V blocks is also important. Um, buy a set of counter bores. This is uh, something that you can you can make. You, it doesn't have to be the best item on Amazon. You can buy a cheap set of counter bores, but uh, ha get a set of counter bores because you're going to want to counter bore your holes. Uh, having a drill index that uh, has fine increments. Uh, the the index that I use all the time is one millimeter to six millimeters in 0.1 millimeter increments, and it's it's just a great uh, set of options to have. And then as machines you're going to want to have, I mean, I think having a metal cutting bandsaw is going to save you a lot of time. I was able to pick mine up for, I think, 100 bucks or maybe even 80 bucks. It was a Craigslist find. I got a floor drill press for about 120 bucks, also a Craigslist find, hugely beneficial. Uh, the milling machine that I have is... Uh, a substantial investment, but uh, having some kind of manual milling machine is going to allow you to, to make parts that you wouldn't otherwise be able to make. Well, along with that, you want to have a quality vise. You want to have a, maybe a rotary table. A rotary table's lower on the list of priorities, but uh, the quality vise is definitely something you're going to want to have on the milling machine. A lathe, I think you can go and spend lots and lots of money on a lathe if you can find a harbor freight mini lathe it's something that you can tune up you're going to learn a lot about the overall machine tuning from from tuning a lathe or a mill that you buy but the, the those little harbor freight mini mills will give you a capability that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, when you're mid build and you need to modify a part or make another part and then the last thing i think is essential is uh, a 3d printer or an fdm printer uh, the one that is my go-to i have a cetus 3d printer it's fairly accurate from a dimensional perspective it's pretty fast the software is good meaning you can you can buy a creality 3d printer and use cura but you're going to do a lot of tuning and tweaking and that's not what you want to spend your time doing if you're building a cnc machine the nice thing about the cetus software is when i load a model in and i print it it prints the print doesn't fail it comes out the way i want it it's dimensionally accurate i don't really have to think about it it doesn't have all the options and the bells and whistles that you might have with cura and and, a, and some other style of printer but it just works and i can't tell you how important it is to have not have to fiddle with your 3d printer so i the cetus is really great and it works with a variety of materials petg is a great material and if you want a prototype of part it's great to be able to use the 3d printer see if it fits uh, maybe you might even use some of these parts longer term and uh, it's a super valuable tool so if i net all that back out Look at look at this list of tools that I mean actually I haven't even really listed all the tools that I've acquired throughout this process. Just for the milling machine, I've spent huge amounts of money on tooling. Uh, the same goes for the lathe. So you start to add up all this additional stuff, and you have a pretty large investment. You can skip it all and go buy a machine that works right out of the box. Uh, if if that's if you just want to make parts, if you're going to manufacture something, you should go do that because you, you, your time is better spent designing the parts, marketing the parts, uh, iterating on the parts, getting feedback from your customers, all of those sorts of things. That's where you should spend your time. If you think these machines are interesting and you want to learn about designing them, then you're going to have to make this investment. And again, it's not any cheaper than going out and buying a machine. So uh, just buckle up, get ready for it. Get ready for a lot of failure. Get ready for a lot of hitting with the wall of frustration as things don't work out the way that you thought they would. But uh, it's a fun journey. And uh, hopefully I've touched on a few of the things that you should be thinking about as you, as you start this hobby. 
If you've got any comments or questions, leave them down below. And I hope that you have some luck in your endeavors. So thanks for watching.